One, two, three, four, five. Unchain my heart. Unchain my heart. Let me go away. Let me go away. Unchain my heart. Unchain my heart. You worry me night and day. Worry me night and day. Ooh. Why lead me through a life of misery? Ooh. When you don't care a bag of beans for me. Unchain, Unchain my heart. Please let me breathe. Welcome to Chatting with Casey with your host, Casey Palmer. Episode 4. It's hard out here for a dad. Welcome to Chatting with Casey, the podcast about family, food, fashion, and faith, and travel, and tech, and the stories encompassing all of that and more. It's been a challenging week as we've seen racism rear its ugly head again. Yes, again. With everyone's favorite loudmouth, Roseanne Barr, losing her new show after comparing a black aide from the Obama administration to an ape on Twitter, had people debate what actually makes for a deadbeat dad as we found out that Drake may have a kid of his own out there, and just dealing with all of the emotions in my own life and in the lives of others. We're here in the hot, hot heat of spring in Toronto, shout out to global warming, and I don't know about you, but with everyone out of their winter hidey holes, it feels like everyone's trying to take advantage of every possible second and let me tell you it is tiring sometimes in fact we even hit up a little girl's first birthday a week ago and it was a trip not only did our kids tower over all these little one-year-olds just finding their footing in life but it showed us just how much our attitudes have changed about parenting in just a few short years if their kids drop some food on the ground it was done for you don't know what kind of germs are down there and you don't want to make those little ones sick if our kids drop food man if the ants hadn't gotten to it first, it was completely fair game to pick it up and eat it. If they're eating fruit that's a little dirty, they're still getting their fruit. And these parents were all tired, but they weren't weary. They hadn't yet dealt with kids who will run around and destroy your home at any available opportunity, or come home and test the colorful language and ideas they picked up at school, or just have, have so much power they can add to their tantrums, arms flailing and voices shrieking, and they trip over the words in frustration. It is amazing. I love my kids, but this stage is hella tough. It's almost like you can't turn your back for a second, not because they'll hurt themselves, but because they're just so curious and nothing in your home is safe unless they don't know about it. And I guess it all links back to this episode's title. It's hard out here for a dad. Balancing our own self-interest with those of others, especially the children whose very lives depend on us making the right decisions working to take care of the family while trying to still be ourselves and follow our dreams when there's all this other stuff that we have to do. And the world doesn't make it easy either. We're aloof, buffoons. We couldn't put dinner together if we tried. Where the world pits moms against each other to be better, craftier, and more stylish than one another, it just kind of expects us all as dads to suck. <laughs> and sure, it makes parts of parenting easy, but damn, People really get it twisted on what it means to be a dad, and that definitely needs to change. And that's all one really long way of introducing my second keynote for the Parenting 101 conference I did over in Kelowna, BC this past February. It's hard out here for a dad. I hope you enjoy it. So I wrote some words. We should probably talk about them. And uh, I'll bring it out for the last keynote of the event. So it's called It's Hard Out Here for a Dad. And uh, originally, so uh, I was asked to do two keynotes. The first one, of course, being the first one on what happens inside the head of a dad. And originally, I was going to come and do a different keynote for the second keynote. But then I came across a video. And I'm not going to share the video because it's done by two lovely women who I do appreciate and whatnot, but it was one of your standard mom versus dad style videos where it's like the mom does everything really perfectly and the dad is a complete slob and acts like he's still a teenager and things don't go well at all and he has no idea of what he's doing. And I was like, yeah, I don't know how I feel about it. Well, I know how I feel about it. I'm not going to say the words because they would be inappropriate and no one wants to hear me say those. But it was one of those things where um, it's, I guess, it 
triggered a nerve in me where I was just like, you know, it's, that's just not who we are as much these days. We are, you know, we're starting to evolve. And I know there's enough guys who, you know, mess up and things like that. Like I, I mentioned that Facebook group from before, 5,000 moms, and my wife will come in and show me, here, hey, look at this, look at this. And I'm like, ugh, you're making these standards hard to keep up. All right. <laughs> but there's a lot of dads who are just more involved. The expectation has gone up that dads are more involved and more present in their children's lives. We are very much there growing alongside our children, and it's not like we're just kind of wandering through the dark, trying to figure things out and you know, ready to mess up the family structure at the drop of a dime. And it's weird because, I mean, it's like, you know, both moms and dads, we're all making mistakes, right? None of us are perfect. We're all messing things up and trying to figure things out with our kids. And I've come home to shrunken sweaters, broken dishes, doors slamming by both adults and children alike. Um, and there's so many things we're trying to figure out. And I'm, one, I'm just curious as to why we can't laugh and grimace at everyone's you know, mistakes that are being made, why it just kind of seems to have the dads as the butt of the joke and also videos and things that come from that and not the other way, but we'll figure that out. I mean, motherhood is obviously one of the toughest jobs out there. No one debates that, we know this. But at the same time, it's, we know not to make fun of motherhood because I think the expecta expectation is there that moms are already hard enough on themselves. Um, you guys are living up to some ridiculous standards from, and it's, Social media has not helped. Uh, you're at a point now where you can compare yourself to every other mom that's around you at any given time. You have this two-year-old had a birthday party with streamers and everything is crazy. You have like a nice like juggler in the front and everything. We have to go even bigger and better. We have to have a can and shoes confetti. And then the next one's gonna be like, oh, I'm gonna have to rent an entire place and have a cake that's like three meters tall. And it just escalates all the time. And we know the pressure's there and everything. And it's just, now we just, what I wanna cover in this talk is just how do we look at this? How do you look at this from a social standpoint and look to equalize the load? How do we learn to laugh at ourselves? How do we learn to make sure that we aren't vilifying one parent over the other? And how do we make it so that everyone can get what they need out of a parenting, household, and relationship instead of trying to point fingers and point blame? So, um, yeah. When I was invited out, I realized there was a unique opportunity at hand to talk about something that we kind of just take for granted, and that comes to the portrayal of fatherhood. And when we talk about dads in society, different images come to mind. You have your uh, Ward Cleavers, you have your Cliff Huxtables, the actor and not the, you know, the individual and not the actor. Like, let's make the difference there. Not, not that guy, not that guy. Cliff Huxtable. All right, all right, we're on the same page. Good, good, good. And uh, you have your Philip Banks, and you have uh, these strong father figures that have been put together in you know, some of our time honored shows who uh, will step in and help their kids through any situations they have, and you know, they do what they have to do as a dad. On the other hand, you have your Homer Simpsons, you have your Peter Griffins, you have your Phil Dumpies from uh, Modern Family, who sometimes gets things right, but usually doesn't. And it's the thing that we've seen over and over again, where you have the dads who are bumbling, buffoons, they are there for comedic effect instead of helping with the actual you know, parental partnership. Basically, you have the mom coming in and saving the day all the time, and if you have two parents in the picture, whether they're in the same house or you know, sharing the load and shared custody or whatnot, if you have two parents in the picture and one parent is doing the majority of the work of raising those kids, that is a problem. <laughs> That's not a good, healthy relationship, and that is something we need to kind of dispel and everything so we can kind of move forward and grow in a healthy way of what we expect from parents, what we expect of you know, what it is to be a parent regardless of gender. And it gets us to a point where we can say, okay, you're a parent, you do this, you do that. And how do we get there? How do we get to a point where you know, we can say that we're happy with like, you know, everyone has their own role to play? Is by changing the narrative one story at a time. And today's keynote will be a collection of different stories of things I've experienced and seen and see if it resonates with you guys when it comes down to you know, what I'm trying to articulate. So one thing you've heard us talk about over and over again is uh, Dad 2.0, the Dad 2.0 Summit. Last, this year was in New Orleans. And there are way more dad bloggers in the States than there are in Canada. As I mentioned earlier, we have about 76 dad fluence. I'm using the word dad fluencer lately, and everyone kind of grimaces. And I'm like, no, I'm gonna, it's going to stick. It's going to be like fetch. I'm going to make it a thing. Um, Dean girls. But yeah, so um, there's about 76 you know, total up here, and they have thousands, like about 1,000 or more down in the States. And 
With that number of dad fluencers, see what I did there, you can affect change. So um, a good example of what happened there is when they talk about uh, the exclusivity in parents and how parenting is represented in the media. So um, you'll find a lot of baby products that are advertised, for example, as the number one choice of moms, mom approved. And there's a, brand, a lot of brands who bend over backward to make sure that moms are, you know, they are taken care of and that they are represented by, you know, the things that are being sold to them. But then what does that say for single dads, stay-at-home dads who have to make the majority of the household decisions because they're the guy at home? Like, do, do, you, do you still... Do you discount their opinions because they are not approving the same things or not making the same decisions? Or do we just kind of assume that they're just OK with everything? And one big example of this, uh, like, we've seen Dad 2.0 and the number, their numbers be able to change some of these perceptions. You had Amazon. Amazon had the Amazon Moms program in the States for a while until they, you know, dads got mad. And they started writing about it and sharing it on social media. And they changed it to Amazon Parents. And there's another few examples of that. One of the worst examples was from Huggies. And I'm going to have to read from this as a direct quote. Um, they had to change an ad there to become more dad positive. Because initially, this was in 2012. Initially, the ad read, the voiceover was, to prove Huggies diapers and wipes can handle anything, we put them to the toughest test imaginable. Dads, alone with their babies, in one house for five days. And we're like, what? 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 Hold on a second here. <laughs> so, yeah, it's just basically you, you, we, it was kind of the cherry on top of the entire idea that dads left alone to their own devices, everything will explode. Your house will be no more. Your children will be unrecognizable. Everything will be horrible. And yeah, you can imagine the dad bloggers didn't really take that one very well. So the conversation was had, petitions were put together. I think change.org, there's a petition that had over, uh, I think it got up to like, 2,000 signatures of like people who are just really outraged by this representation. And eventually, they did change the wording to go to, to prove Huggies diapers can handle anything. We asked real dads to put them to the test with their own babies at nap time after a very full feeding. And they still use the same footage. They change the voiceover. But it's like little things that can be adjusted in order to make sure that we're not you know, trying to treat Dads is like a hindrance to the uh, household and everything, and trying to make sure that everyone belongs, everyone feels like they belong to an actual productive structure, and not have this, you know, mom versus dad, him versus her type thing that sometimes is uh, articulated in media. And it's tough. I mean, you're talking about us as individuals, as individual parents, unless, you know, unless you're like Kanye or, you know, whoever. You don't have as much influence as a corporation who has like bottomless pockets and tons of influence to put out a message. And so I guess it's up to us to start those conversations and make sure that we are seeing things and representing things in the right light, that if we see something that doesn't feel right, whether it's a mom or dad representation, that we are tackling it and putting people to task, saying that this is not the truth. This is not how we want to be represented. This is not how we should hold a standard so that we all feel like that we're being taken back decades and decades ago. I wouldn't expect to, you know, things that worked in I Love Lucy days don't work in 2018 and things like that, where I'm just like, we need to continue to be progressive and continue to explore new options and make sure that we're all, you know, thinking, living in a world where uh, parenting is seen as an equal job, no matter what the family structure looks like. And, but perception in the media is only part of it. There's, there's other day-to-day -day interactions as well that um, have stuck with me and helped to kind of illuminate what I'm talking about when it comes to this entire public perception thing. Um, my second son was born January 27th, 2016. And I remember clearly, we went out one day to get groceries. So we dropped off his brother at daycare. The two of us went over to the grocery store. Everything's good. You know, We have a list split in half. My wife went to the produce section. I was in the meat section, had our little guy in the stroller, and I was like, and uh, sorry, the shopping cart, and I was going through and trying to get some things. And this older woman came up to me, and she's like, oh, the mom let you go out with a baby by yourself? <laughs> OK, hold on. <laughs> so one, like the mother, she's not like a nameless like baby-making machine. Like I'm married to a woman who has a name and everything, so she's not like, yeah, that's, that was not cool. Two, it was, you know, it wasn't my first radio, second kid. I was pretty comfortable with the entire, like, okay, I can take this baby outside. He's not going to, like, spontaneously combust or anything. Everything's going to be cool. It's going to be good. 
And three, like, unless, you know, my mom could say something like that, I'd be like, mom, you're crazy. But a stranger, like, how, how does a stranger feel that they have the right to tell a parent how to raise their kid? It was, it was felt like, you know, that perhaps, I don't even know how you can see that as, like, helpful advice. I have no clue. But it was like one of those things where just kind of like, how do you just step in like that and like, you know, go and tell the dad? It's like, hmm, don't think you're doing a good enough job there, sir. It was, it was really weird for me. And I had to kind of like, I, there's a million things. You know, you have these things that happen to you and then you have like a million things you wish you said at the moment. I think I need to build a time machine so I can go back to that moment and be like, okay, here's like the list of a thousand things I wrote up in the years after and I need to tell you one by one until the store's closed. <laughs> but, but. <laughs> It's, it was kind of an example for me of uh, what can happen and how we can see, you know, how, you know, and I think it was a generational thing as well, but you can kind of see that there's still these perceptions that, you know, dads aren't enough. And it's weird. I hear horror stories from dads on parental leave who feel uncomfortable going to uh, play groups and going to parks because they're the only dad there in a group of moms and they just don't feel like they fit in. Or like there's the dads who go to parks with their kid and then they have to go through the Spanish Inquisition of like, who's your kid? And they ask the kid, okay, is that your dad? Let's corroborate that evidence. And they just, they, everyone has to make sure that he's not like out there to snatch their own kid away. And I've seen that happen, I've heard that actually more times than I like to admit that I, like, if it was a one-off thing, I'd be like, okay, like bad luck. But you know, it happens more often than that. I actually almost, uh, I almost freaked out at my younger guy's daycare because they have a strict like ID policy of like making sure that they know exactly who the person is who's picking up the kid. And the first time I went there, I went to pick him up, and I was like, oh yeah, because I live in a very, very non-black neighborhood. Just <laughs> got to preface with that. So I went to pick him up, I was like, oh, it's like it's Xavier's dad. Hey, daddy's here. He ran over to me. I'm like, how do you know that? <laughs> I didn't show you any ID. And I was like, because your picture's on the wall. I'm like, okay, 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 okay. <laughs> So that was, that was one freak out easily quelled, you know. Logic, logic helps. <laughs> but we, we, you know, it's tough out there being a dad or any parent in the world that's trying, we, the definitions of parent are changing, of parenthood is changing. And we're trying to define whether expectations bet- behind fatherhood and motherhood are in 2018. And I think we can do better, and I think we need to do better when it comes down to how we approach it. I mean, parenting, parenting's hard. Everyone knows parenting's hard, well. Non-parents might not know how hard parenting is, but we all know, right? Everyone in this room, we all know how hard parenting is. And sometimes, I mean, there's, there's parenting is hard from the very nature of it, but I have to say, even though I talked about some of the situations that happen to dads and the things we go through, there are definitely times where being mom is harder than dad because the bar can be really, really low for us to succeed as dads. Sometimes the world is just like, you know, they'll give you a pat on the back for the, the most ridiculous things. So... Once upon a time, we were driving out to Ottawa with our two kids, and we stopped over halfway. It's like a regularly like a four and a half hour drive from Toronto with kids. It's about 45 hours, you know? So we stopped over to get some lunch, and Sarah went over to Burger King to get some lunch for herself and myself, and I, had, I was baby wearing the younger one, and I had the other one by the hand as we went over to Tim Hortons to get them some grilled cheese or something, you know, really simple, because anything complex, they look at it, it's like, oh, they like grills. I'm like, that's a pickle. So we had, like we tried to keep it basic. So I go in line and I have them there and I'm just waiting in line to go order them food and then this conversation unfolds behind me. He's like, "Oh, are those yours?" And the next woman's like, "No, I thought they were yours." I was like, "Oh, they're so cute. Where's their mom?" And I was and me being you know we're polite Canadians here, right? I turn around I'm like, "Well." My wife went to Burger King to get some food for us, and uh, yeah, I'm just here to get some food for the boys. And I'm like, oh, by yourself? You're such a good dad. I'm like, you give me an award for standing in line with my boys to get food? That is the most ridiculous thing ever. I have gotten parenting, I like calling them parenting awards, for like the silliest things, like, Let's see, I, have, I wrote a list because I thought you guys should know all the things I've won really stupid awards for. So I have won awards for taking my kids to school, carrying them on my shoulders, feeding them lunch in public, stopping them from crying when they're out in public, uh, cleaning, the, cleaning a boo-boo on their cheek. <laughs> like, you fall over, you scrape, and you get a little dirt on your cheek. Here you go. I was like, oh, good job. I'm like, mm-mm, mm-mm. We need to appreciate that, you know, 
the dad's doing one-off things, dad's doing little things to help out their kids because they're supposed to, doesn't deserve an award. It's something that's just kind of, we do it because we're supposed to. That's, what, that's our role. That's what we do as dads. And uh, we kind of have to take it from two different approaches, where it's one, we need to stop being so surprised uh, that dads know how to parent because they're parents. And we need to set a new standard of what makes a good dad. The dad who maybe shows up once a month by choice and gives his kid a new toy to appease the fact that they've been gone for like weeks on end versus the dad who's in there every day changing diapers, cooking meals, and whatever. They shouldn't be the same. There's, there has to be an actual standard, an actual bar that we hold you know, everyone to to make sure that we have you know, a good idea of what makes a good parent. And the other one is just to stop giving all parents a hard time. It's hard enough doing this already. We don't need to stick our nose in and judge others and go in there and try to impose our own experiences on others' lives. We can try and you know, say, we can preface things by saying, in my life I did this and it worked, yada, yeah, yeah, yeah. But when it comes down to the more negative approach to it of saying, you know, it's like, I think you're doing that wrong. It's like, you don't know my kids. <laughs> we need to try to change the actual conversation that happens so that we can do it in a very productive manner and make sure that no one feels like they're not enough as a parent. So it is hard out here for a dad. It's hard out here for a mom. It's hard for anyone who's trying to deal with all the challenges that come from raising children. But we're better off to respect that than to ridicule it. So in the end, um, we have a long way to go before we stop you know, seeing this class system between parents and trying to equalize that. Um, but I know, you know, I see, I've talked to dads here. I know there's dads like uh, Dale, for example, who are very involved in their kid's life. And as you guys deal with things every day, I know that you, you don't have to give things off to one parent or the other to deal with three kids under three. And I don't know. I don't know how to, I'm, <laughs> I'm still trying to figure that out. But uh, you guys are stronger than I am. Uh, and I see um, the dads who go down to the Dad 2 Summit who um, come with their past mistakes. They talk about past addiction, they talk about incarceration, they talk about all these things that they've been through and how they've grown and learned from it. They talk about their current concerns about how they are not enough in some cases or they feel like their past mistakes and things don't make them the right role models for their own children and things of that nature. They talk about what they want to strive for the future but seems unattainable, how they want to be a certain kind of dad and be able to do certain things for their children but they can't seem to find the path to get there. There's already enough happening to make the parenthood journey um, hard, and we just need to, I guess, be more compassionate, be more ready to understand that everyone has their own thing to deal with, and we don't need to be the ones getting in the way of that. It's just not our place to do so. There are many different kinds of dads as there are fish in the sea, and hopefully we'll eventually live in a world that reflects that. So, to finish, I'll give you a bonus pro tip, though. I figured that I should give you something actual tangible to go home with. And it is, if you want a dad to do something that he doesn't feel like doing, you just need to disguise it as something he wants to do. That's what Sarah does to me. I, I, she thinks I don't get it. I know what's going on. I understand what's happening. So let me explain. So I'm a nerd. I grew up on a solid diet of cartoons and video games. I love Japanese anime. I am like the biggest nerd ever. That's how I roll. It's good. I used to go to comic adventures all the time. I used to draw comics and sell my own comics at comic adventures. That's how nerdy I am. Mm -hmm. It's up there. It's up there. <laughs> so um, I hated cooking for the longest time, though. I hated cooking because my dad used to run a restaurant. And in that restaurant, my dad wanted me to go through the full gamut of jobs to make sure I never wanted to own a restaurant or work in a restaurant for the rest of my life. <laughs> you would be extra hard on me, as, as opposed to all the other staff members. He's like, OK. I'm like, all right, I see. You're good at the till. You're good at doing numbers. Let's put you in the kitchen. And in the kitchen, my, my, my speed, like, I can cut. I can prepare food, I can cook food, but not nearly at the fast as the speed he wanted me to do it. He'd be like, no, 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 you have to do like I'm like, so, you've been doing this 15 years by this point? Maybe build some skills in that time, I don't know. I've been doing 15 minutes. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that, that kind of left a negative impression on me for a long time and didn't want to cook. Uh, fortunately, Sarah loves cooking, so it kind of worked out, but we get busier as the kids get older. She's like, maybe you need to step up. I'm like, yeah, okay, maybe. So. Um, the, the solution to the problem of me not wanting to cook actually came in the form of, wait for it, a cooking anime. Yes, I said it. A cooking anime. A cartoon about cooking. I'm not even kidding. It's called Shokugeki no Soma, or called Food Wars in English. And it's basically an anime about an elite culinary school where people settle like their class system and everything through cook-offs. Right? Right? And it's like, it's crazy, because what happens is like, you're, you're watching it and you're learning at the same time. I'm like learning like, Oh, man, you mean 
honey breaks down the protease in meats and makes it more tender, and that's why it's in marinades? Or what? I could use like a crispy bread coating to like lock the juices in on my meats when I'm like cooking it in frying oil, and it's going to be more delicious? I'm learning things that I actually want to implement. And I go in the kitchen, I'm like, yeah, this is great. I'm doing this. Like I was, I was talking to uh, Cheryl Pab last night about sous vide and all the things I sous vide in my sous vide machine at home and things like that. So I am now interested in cooking because I watched an anime that made me want to cook. So if you have, a, if you have those chores that you want to do, if you have to like, you know, go and put the caulking in on the bathroom, you better find some sort of like cool caulking comic book or something or a novel about the, the best caulker in all of Kelowna who like goes out and makes like bathrooms really shiny and sparkly or something. You just got to package it in the right way and then I'm sure it's going to be amazing and everything. So sounds lame, but it works. It's just that's my only tip I can give you for this. And uh, yeah, parenting life hacks, that's it. So I'm pretty good at writing, and I do well enough speaking from a script, and it helps me bring my ideas into a new format when I do. But I think where my passion really shines is when I'm in conversation with other people, where my most honest thoughts come out when I speak. So that said, here's some of the topics that we discovered in the conversations with the awesome audience over at Parenting 101 with some of their very insightful questions they had to ask me as a parenting expert, which I still don't fully understand, but I'm going to roll with it. Do dads ever step up without being asked to first? It depends on two things. Depends on the guy and depends on the habits that have been formed. So Sarah, um, in her infinite wisdom, forced me to do certain things on a, uh, over and over again. Like, for example, let's say I don't want to give the kids a bath because I just don't like getting my clothes wet because I like my clothes and I don't like them having soap all over them. <laughs> right? So um, she'd just be like, all right, no one's going to bed then. And they'd just be up and I'd be like, oh. So you're not gonna, you know, oh, now you have to. Uh. So after enough times of like bathing the kids and being able to get them used to it and just doing it, like now I just bathe the kids when I like if it's like a certain time, I'll be like, bath time, go, 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 now we're going. And it's it's one of those things where it's kind of you almost have to like step back and let the world burn, <laughs> let things crumble, and see like it's like okay, this is what happens if things don't happen, and someone needs to step up and do it. And if you don't want to be the one always doing it, just you know let him get in a situation situation where he feels that burn, and then it's just like ah, perhaps I need to step up so that we have some sanity in the household. Is how Sarah's approached it, I guess, and I, that's oh yeah, yeah. That, that initial stress, I, it's, what is it, the uh, short-term pain, long-term gain? Get, the entire, get everyone into a position where they are dealing with all the household issues and everyone feels the impact of it. And then hopefully they'll get everyone in a position where they're ready to be like, okay, maybe we don't want this to happen and this is what we should do to make sure we don't have this happen again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, mom strike. Mom strike, not, it's, it's, you know, it sounds, it sounds insane, but I, I think there could be some merit to it as long as it's not, like, as long as no one's starving. If they're starving, that's a problem. But, you know, they'll probably solve that too. It's, what was it, Allison was talking about, they'll get tired after three days of cereal and peanut butter sandwiches? Yeah, so there you go. Is your job away from home easier than raising the kids at home? In my personal situation, um, I found my dad worked hard so I wouldn't have to work in the same capacity so I could be home. To be with the kids, so my days go a little like I wake up around uh, six o'clock with the kids, get them ready for school, get them to school, get to work, do the work, um, then you know Sarah usually picks them up. I'm usually home within like a half hour after they're home because I, I live close to where I work, and through that I'm able to kind of bridge that gap so that I'm able to be present and able to help out with things and whatnot. But I know understand that's not a common situation. I know there's a lot of um, Households where either one per parent's working really hard and you don't see them as much in the waking hours of the children, or both parents are working really hard and you have like after, after, before and after care at schools and things like that, or long, you know, daycares that have to take care of the kids. One, I guess, part of it is, you know, there's only so much that someone's going to understand by not being in a situation. The household is a common situation where everyone is there and understanding what's happening. Sarah wouldn't understand what I go through at work. I wouldn't understand what goes on in her job. We're both working parents, and we both have different degrees of difficulty with what's happening in the workplace. And I just kind of have to, my assumption at any given day with Sarah, and I hope she does be the same courtesy, is that work is horrible. I go at the bar, work is horrible, and it sucked, and you're probably drained, but you still need to do what you need to do. And so I try to go with the fact that there are two jobs, household and the job that pays the bills are two jobs. Um, you are putting, you're, 
it's, I don't want to put, be so crass, but you're basically putting out all this energy doing something you don't necessarily want to be doing when it comes down to you know, changing a diaper or yelling or trying to discipline or try to take care of a document or whatever you do for your job. And if we recognize, I think, that you, know, you are not, you're, you're sacrificing your time in order to take care of the people you love and that you are doing things you don't necessarily want to put as a priority, but you need to do them anyway. If we treat it like that and see that everyone's on the same page as per life is hard and sometimes it sucks, but as long as we can respect that the time is there and being used towards common family goals rather than you know, it's a selfish thing that you're going out to work and then you're, you're not home taking care of the kids. You have to pay for groceries. You have to pay to keep a roof over your head. And I think it's just we sometimes need that reminder that um, a lot of the things we're considering choices aren't choices. They're things that have to happen. And if something needs to adjust around the household to make sure that that can happen and it feels like everything is being done in the household at the same time, whether it's you know, having a talk with the boss to you know, get out of there a little earlier or anything of that nature. That's a you know, personal family discussion that has to happen. But I think it's possible to change the perception to say that you know, there's things we need to do in order to make sure that the family structure can stay stable and we just have to have those hard conversations and build that level of respect between you know, the parents and adults in the household. How can we help new dads get comfortable in their roles? I think, honestly, um... In the first year of having a kid, it was really just, a part of it is patience, obviously. I think we can all be patient with each other in any parenting situation, but a lot of it is just kind of knowing that unless he, you know, had a, a doula for a mom or anything like that, where it's just kind of like you're around kids all the time, this may be his first experience with like any little kids, right? Usually are playing around with little nephews, nieces who are five, six and above. But for little kids, we generally don't know a lot of what's going on. And you can read books and you can do a lot of things in order to educate yourself on what's out there. But a lot of it's just touch and go and feeling your way through it. So I, I always, what I've heard and what I've talked about often with um, a lot of moms in our neighborhood anyway, when you have young kids, is you have to give him room to fail, if you will. In that, you know, we, I, I screwed up. I, I screw up as many times as I'm willing to admit. I screwed up a lot. A lot. When it comes to raising kids, and it's, got, it's at the point now where I, I've, you know, built a good routine and understanding of how to raise my kids because I've done all those failures and learned from those mistakes. That now, if I, you know, screw something up or forget something, well, one, my older son will tell me right away. He's like, "Dad, you didn't do that the way mom does it." I'm like, "I don't want to do it the way mom does it." <laughs> but also, it's, uh, yeah, you, you just give him room to screw up and give him room to find his way through those failures, and you'll probably get a better and more supportive partner out of it because he now knows that he's got all that out of the way and now can just do the things the way they need to be done to support your family in the best way possible. How do you feel about spanking your kids? Um, I'm fortunately pretty even-tempered, so my entire willingness to like spank my kids is pretty, it takes a lot, like a lot to get there. But um, what I have inherited from my father is his glare which has proven very useful for my sons to understand that something's going to happen. I've actually, I'm really surprised actually in the variety of ways I can express to my children that they are on thin ice without actually having to do much. So the other day, you know, my, they both like to stand on the kitchen chair and play with the light switch and everything. And I just put my hand up. I was like, started counting down with my hand. And he's like, oh, back down off the chair, I sat down. I'm like, I didn't think that was going to work. <laughs> I was like, the first time I did it, I'm like, he already knew what it meant. That's amazing. So I'm, I'm often just experimenting. Like, it's me whatever way I want to express, you know, my frustration at an action at any given time. And I try to do it in a way that is very visible and tangible to them. So you can, I can yell at them over and over again and say, you know, I told you like 10 times not to do that. They're not keeping track. But if I do anything that's like a countdown time or anything like that, so they understand that they have, you know, I'm giving them time before there's a consequence for that action. That seems to have worked so far. It won't work forever. I, I know this. Like, they'll get to a point where it's like, I call your bluff, Dad. <laughs> but for now, it's working okay. How do you help your children celebrate their heritage and culture? Culture, culture is a weird thing for me because being born in Toronto, it's like my, well, Mississauga next to Toronto, but it's kind of weird where it's like my culture is almost like I diluted Jamaican culture where I you know, have that background. 
and I bring it into like food and music and things like that. We listen to a lot of funk, soul, reggae. Like we don't listen to a lot of children's music. Most of the stuff that we listen to is like from the 60s and 70s, and then they end up being the weird kids at school who like you know want to rock a vinyl instead of an iPod. Um, but yeah, um, I'm always concerned about culture because Toronto is a very multicultural city, and so I'm like, is our culture then the intersection where we live? Is it our neighborhood in this you know, patchwork community of all these neighborhoods? What is their culture? I keep asking myself this almost every day. And I think it's one of those things where they are just going to have to come up with this huge blend of culture. I'm from a Jamaican background. Um, my wife Sarah is from a Dutch background. We're both born in Toronto area. So it's like they are second or third generation through one of her you know, arms of her, of her family, but they're like, Multi, they're in a deep enough Canadian state in their lives where I think they're going to have to almost define that themselves and we can just kind of feed them as much information and as much culture as we can and see what they take from it. Yeah. So, yeah, I think it's huge, hugely important to include as part of the upbringing conversation, but ultimately they're going to take what they want from it and make it their own. I even found that when you come together and have kids, it's, there's so many cultural differences. Like with Sarah's family, they were always like talking over each other. It's like, you know, who can talk the loudest to be heard? Whereas my family is like this entire like stiff upper lip uh, British upbringing where it's like you wait for the person to be done completely and you make sure they're done talking until you start talking on your next thing. And so even trying to like do that to figure out the overlap between those still hasn't borne fruit. We're still working on that. I haven't actually finished a conversation in 10 years, but um, I'll get there. I'll get, we'll get there, right? It'll work out. It'll be good. What is the dad's role today? Goes back to those um, other dads I mentioned who I met in the neighborhood. We do get together and we do try to have those conversations, but let's, let's look at it like this. So that group, that Facebook group of 5,000 moms I mentioned, we have a dad version of it as well for the same community, which has about 300 people in it, right? And that's how many dads you can get signed up for it. It's pretty good, right? Except when you talk about the frequency of how these, how these groups are being used, you're talking about like 60 to 70 new posts a day on the other Facebook group versus like one a week on the dad group, right? <laughs> So the role, the role is really like we need to be more open to the conversations and, we, and, and there's the attempt there. Like I'll have very honest conversations with my fellow dads in the neighborhood when we go out for drinks or whatnot. We'll talk about what's going on. And we try to go deeper than just the, my kid did this and it's annoying. This happened and it's whatever. We try to go into like the understanding of what happens and why we choose to do things. And we make breakthroughs. It's just, I think we're just so expected to not assess that part of ourselves that it's just going to take more intention to keep having those conversations and keep um, being very intentional about expressing that. That'll get us to a point where we can have a better understanding of you know, what that role is. Right now, I think it's just the role is to have the willingness to move in that direction. The role right now is to be more open to um, sharing how we go through our parenthood experiences and see if others will learn from that. And we're just very much in the nascent stages of trying to figure out how we can build something so that the dads to come, all the dads in the future, will have something to look back on and be like, oh, this is, this is what works. Okay, cool. So that any dad out there that feels like they're isolated or that no one understands what they're going through or they don't really have anyone to talk to will at least have some sort of footprint to say, okay, this is what I can use in order to help establish my path and then go from there. And that's another week in the bag for chatting with Casey, looking to make sense of a dad life that has the odds stacked against it. With Father's Day less than two weeks away, I hoped I helped you think about fatherhood a little differently. It's not something you get trapped into or can solve with a bit of money. It's a calling that you either live up to. Otherwise, frankly, you don't deserve to be called a dad. Tune in next week where I talk with Gloria Chick creator of the fly pack and talk with other parents about their situations and what we can learn from them have yourself a great week and we'll see you then bye bye